when the meeting starts, but please, anybody's welcome. Um, I'll go in the kitchen. Since we don't uh, meet right now, we figured this is here. a way for people to socialize a little bit. So if you see somebody that you'd like to say hi to, please uh, say hi or ask a question or share something that you've been doing outdoors. Or have people been take have you people been taking uh, a bunch of hikes lately? Well, there are um, there are some Saturday and Sunday hikes scheduled, and they're on the website calendar. And then there's a Thursday morning women's hike that's scheduled. And occasionally, people are leading a hike on a Monday or a Tuesday. Uh, so all of those hikes get posted on the at ADK GVC calendar. On the website. On the website, yeah. Yeah, the half an hour, I was surprised. Yeah, well. Anyway, so this is in place of our, you know, little social gathering. We don't have Tom here with cookies, but you're supposed to bring your own and your own <laughs> coffee or tea. Yeah, I've got some tea here. Zoom link and the passcode. And, There's 47 uh, participants so far. 47? Wow. Wow, that's great. Yeah, that's a... You need Kill, to it's a little that. hard to hear you. It's hard to hear me? Yes. Oh. You don't have a lot of volume. Hmm, okay. Good to know. I'll see if I can turn myself up. If folks are having a hard time hearing, make sure that the audio on your computer is turned all the way up, okay? Uh, there are buttons usually at the top of the keyboard for for increasing the volume. Uh, you may also be able to go down to the very lower right corner of your computer and click on a place to increase the volume. That's usually what people have trouble with when they're not hearing is they can't, the volume is not up high enough on their computer. Is anybody else hearing ding dongs? I keep that's hearing a ding people, dong. That's from people actually coming into the meeting. Oh, okay. Oh, there must be a lot of people then. <laughs> so a lot of ding dongs. <laughs> so we have 49 people who've joined us so far. Oh, which okay. Is great. Uh, and I'll try to mute when I'm not speaking so that you don't hear as many ding dongs in background. Noise. <laughs> okay. But it's, it's absolutely wonderful to have so many people here tonight. Thanks for coming. Yes. I don't know. Do Am I any louder, Phil? Yeah, it's a little better, yes. Okay. I did turn something up. I don't want to be yelling at people or anything, so give me a heads up. So, Dave, Harrison, have you found any good hikes lately? Just local, just local things, the county parks. You know, I was thinking of, of hiking uh, with a friend on the Crescent Trail, but I was told that there's hunting in some parts of that trail. Does anybody know if that's the case? I do know that that's the case. Uh, there, there is some bow hunting on the Horizon Hill uh, part, and um, we did, we did. I, I have hiked that section three or four times uh, while the bow hunting has been on. But there's, I've seen no one uh, hunting, and I wore an orange vest in part because I was leading a hike there. And I didn't realize ahead of time that it was a hunting area before I scheduled it. And um, I, I am told that if, if it's a bow hunting area, that they need to uh, be, that, that really, uh, they have to be really close to uh, the deer or whatever to really hit it. So right. some kind of a little bit of safety in that they're going to probably recognize you as a person and not a deer. Right. Uh, Where is the Horizon Hill section? Horizon Hill is the one on at the end of Garnsey Road, down by the Harris um, building. Garnsey okay. and 96. But, but not all, I don't think all of the Crescent Trails have yeah. one. I don't know, I'm, I'm up there 30 seconds. Thank you. 
Christian, yeah. Christian, me, David Harrison, Nichols, <clears throat> De Silva, Williams, Barbara. No, I'm not. Uh, but Dan, it's, David, I'd like to it's ten times the amount that goes into cancer research. Yeah. I also tell you that well, five thousand people will die this year. Okay. I also tell you that one in every four will be affected with disease. And a little bit. If you are talking at your call with uh, somebody that you're with, we can we need money for research. It may not save my life. It may save Kim, Kim De Silva. Kim De Silva. Can you mute? There we go. Okay, so um, so I had to mute one of the individuals because they were speaking a little too loudly and not joining the group. Uh, sorry about that. Well, let's see what else is happening, Steve. Uh, we've got a couple weeks till Christmas, so is that on everybody's mind? Are you all getting ready for Christmas? The holidays, not everybody celebrates Christmas. I, have a I put up my tree a few days ago. Here. So somebody's put up a tree. How many people have their trees up? I do. We don't. Yeah. I do. All right, Betty, you do? Yep. On your way. And is anybody shopping in stores or all online? A lot of online for me. <laughs> <laughs> Home Depot is about the only store that I've shopped, actually shopped in other than Wegmans. Uh-huh. I, I shop only for one person, Jill. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I find I can essentially do that via Amazon. You know, we reach that stage. We don't need any more stuff. That's right. <laughs> you know, so. You know, unfortunately, the Williamses are doing a lot of online shopping. I'm not happy about it, but it's the safe way to go. It right. is the safe way to go. Well, who is this young member who's joining us tonight, Todd? Well, Jill, you might remember Benjamin. He was in my wife's belly when I yeah. gave my talks. Well, here he is now. He's a cutie. Hi, Benjamin. Adorable. What is our camera? Awesome. Like? Hi, Benjamin. <laughs> well, here we are. Yeah. I'm gonna say hi. That's Jill. Uh -huh. Hi. He's good at Zoom. We go to Story Hour at the library on Zoom. He good. goes to work with mommy in the upstairs bedroom. He's good. <laughs> yeah. All these different events in each room in the house, huh? Yep. <laughs> yep. And he can join his brothers in the living room if he wants. Yep. Life. This is a new kind of life, isn't it? Here he we likes it. For our Wednesday night entertainment at the computer. I'm so happy that there's so many people here, and I'm sorry if it's a surprise to some of you that we have a social half hour for a little bit. Um, but do, so, do we have some new? We have one new people. I, do you pronounce your name Shara or Shara? Shara. Shara Pete. Yes. She has just moved here from the Cold River chapter and joined the uh, Genesee Valley chapter. Do we have any other new members? Sarah like Mastro is new. Say that again? Sarah Mastro. Sarah Mastro. So you're a new member? Yes. Well, oh, yep. We're glad you're here. And how did glad you be here? How'd you find us? Um I uh, we've been climbing the high peaks for two years now, and it just seemed like a natural fit once we went to some of the parking areas that we would support the organization. So well, here we are. <laughs> we are thrilled that you're uh, joining us. So what? Welcome, did you hike? Yeah, did you hike some high peaks this year? We did. We managed to get a few in. So we did White Face and Esther, Big Slide, Phelps Tabletop, Nyan Street. I'd say a few. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> are you working on the forty six? We are, yep. Hoping to get to halfway next year. Awesome. Okay. Who, where are the 46ers here? Who's a 46er? Wave your hand or say hello. Oh. Hi. Hey, hello. <laughs> and Sue, you are? Well, and Todd. Yeah. And, 
And I want to know whether Dave has a beard. Dave Nichols? Yes. He has a beard. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. Quite the view there for you, Sue. <laughs> I want to know how to get hold of Shara Peets since I'm a Cold River chapter member. Oh, it's uh, Cold River. Uh, excuse me, if it, Black River uh, oh, in Watertown. Yeah, I was say, if you were the, yeah. Makes uh, where's sense. Cold River? What? Uh, there's, where is Cold River? It's the whole central area, Long Lake, oh. Blue Mountain Lake, Indian Lake, oh, yeah. all the way down to Chestertown. Yes. Do you know the what the Watertown area? I'm from north of Watertown, the uh, Thousand Islands area is where I have come from. Yeah, makes more sense, Black River. Yeah. Yeah. I'm from up that way too, Shara. I'm from Waddington. Originally. Oh, yes. <laughs> Even further north <laughs> than <Yeah>. Theresa. <laughs> yep. <laughs> well, there, there's still well, Jill, if, we're, if you want to talk a little bit about progress on, on adventures, the uh, Williams family, um, over Thanksgiving, we climbed the last remaining Catskill fire towers that we have. Uh, really? Now we have we have two remaining fire towers to complete the fire tower challenge. Oh, that's they're all, awesome! They're all down there in the uh, governor and you know that so the southeast corner of the Adirondacks that we don't get to as often. That's, that's what you need to do. The ones in the southeast corner of the Adirondacks. Um, yeah, like Spruce, Vanderwacker. No way we're getting feedback. Yeah. Yeah, Spruce, Vanderwacker, Snowy. Hmm. I don't know what the other ones are down in that area that we haven't done. Yeah. But I have. Um, we're trying, trying to save Belfry for the last one just to get a few people to come join us on a quarter there's mile walk. There's a Snowy in the Catskills too? No, Snowy in the Adirondacks. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. That's, that's the biggest of the fire towers. It's the tallest mountain that has a fire tower on it. Yeah. Snowy is? Snowy's a great one. Okay, Dave and I are working on the uh, fire towers, but we haven't we haven't pursued it too much lately. So we still have uh, we still have two in the Catskills and several in the Adirondacks. But hmm, well, we'll have to talk further and get some more recommendations from you. I'll, I'll yeah, we, we tackled Red Hill and. Um, Balsam Lake Mountain. Those are the two that we did at Thanksgiving. Okay. Found a hotel that had a eat-in kitchen. Pretty nice self-contained place with a exterior entrance. You know, no no interior hallways to the hotel. Uh -huh. So be safe. Pretty safe hotel to go to. Where where was that hotel? Uh, it was the Catskill Seasons Inn. Okay. Right in uh, Shandaken, right, right near Belly Air Mountain, a ski resort there. Okay. Todd, Todd, did you look at the lodging in Clarieville? Um, yeah, I think we drove through Clarieville, yes. Um, well, yeah, yes, yeah, so you would have to go through Clarieville to reach Red Hill. Yeah, I think, yeah, we came in from Roscoe to do Red Hill, but I think after we climbed Red Hill, we drove through Clarieville on the way up to Shandaken. Right. Right. I, I didn't notice any accommodations. Well, it's a tiny little small place. It's a tiny little motel right at the back of the a little cluster of buildings on the north side of the road. Quite indistinguishable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm endlessly surprised at how the cat skills have not uh, not changed much. Like the Adirondacks have changed significantly mm -hmm. over the past thirty years. No, they haven't. The, the Catskills, I mean, even we stayed at, uh, about seven years ago, we stayed at a, at a place near Hunter Mountain, you know, pretty close to the Northway, or 87 anyway. It's probably not called the Northway when you're south of Albany, but um, yeah, it was just a, still a mom and pop operation, pretty small hotel. Okay. Well, we've got to get back there. Okay. 
Anybody still doing some hiking in the Adirondacks for the winter or the Catskills? Anybody have any plans to do any uh, outdoor adventures over the holiday? Christmas, Hanukkah, New Year's? Depends if there's snow on the ground. Yeah. Do you like to cross country ski, Phil? Yeah, yes. Where do you where do you do that? Uh, well, I've got a big out on off of Guernsey Road. There's a great big field, and I'll go out there. But well, I've gone some other places too. I can't remember them. Uh -huh. Usually, I'm downhill skiing. But okay. The, the restrictions on downhill skiing are so. Uh, uh, involved. It's, you got to make a reservation ahead of time. Mm -hmm. There are, uh, you know, all kinds of things. So is Bristol open yet? Uh, I think they're going to be open this weekend, but, but you can't, you got to put your boots yeah. on in your car. Uh, oh gosh. Uh, um, that's the part I'm not looking forward to because I, I get a winter season pass, like a twilight pass. Bristol is opening tomorrow. Right. Again, Paul? Yeah, but it's only for advanced skiers, not yes. even intermediate. Oh. And they've got so many different rules. It's, you got to call up and make a reservation and. Uh, Okay. Well, I'm hoping the snow starts coming so we can do the cross country. Mm -hmm. I'm in for that. So. Well, I waxed all three sets of my cross country skis, so I might have, you know, put the kibosh on that for a little while. Because, you know, <laughs> as soon as you wax all the skis, then forget yeah. it. <laughs> That's a little, prep, a little bit of too much preparation to ward it off. <laughs> Murphy's Law. Yeah, Murphy's Law. I understand. Well, so. it's fun to go cross country skiing in Menden's Park, Menden Ponds Park. There's some that's, nice areas. Yeah, that's where Dave and I like to go. We like to ski the South Meadow, but I know a lot of people ski the North Meadow and a lot of people do Quaker Pond. Mm -hmm. Webster Don't Park is good. Don't forget to ski up to the water tower. Well, <laughs> only, only if there's enough snow that you can make it down <laughs> without dying. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Annie. I know yeah. you can do that. <laughs> oh, it's it's always a huge accomplishment when you can make that turn without crashing. <laughs> yeah, down Pond Hill. Whatever they want to call it, it's water tower to us. So, yep. has anybody been to Harriet Hollister? Does anybody know what the snow conditions are there? Um, I saw on the Rochester Cross Country Ski Foundation Facebook page that there's a guy that lives up there, what's his name, Steve Durago or something like that. And he posts like daily when there's enough snow up there to ski. So he said he didn't ski the trails at Harriet last week, but like in his yard, he did, which is right was, over there. It was really good skiing there this morning. Oh yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was gonna warm up and get a little bit softer now, I think. But there was still some skiing last week, but it was kind of warm. And even the last few days, there was still skiing. And uh, last night in, in the dark and this morning, it was really good skiing up there. They're going to start grooming up there Monday. Ooh, is that fairly oh, level? Hey. Rick's how is that at Harriet, Harriet Hollister? I've only walked through there, and it seems fairly level to me. Oh, uh, as far as the trails, you mean? Yes, yeah, yeah. As far as the ski, ski trail. Yeah, there's a whole mix of them. There's a you know a map online and a map right at the entrance. But if you've never been there before, you can start you know out by going on the road that goes straight through the center, and then use the map to go. There, there's everything from really gentle to you know a little bit steeper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's like about close to 15 miles of trails, and they start grooming on Monday. It's awesome mm -hmm. up there. Um, I did talk to a friend of mine who is out in the Syracuse area, and I guess they are opening Osceola Ski Center after all. Like last year was supposed to be his last year, but
but I guess they sold off part of it and people are going to they're going to groom the trail still so if you've been out that way I haven't I haven't looked to see what the conditions are Columbia, Carolina, Oregon, a land that's been out that way. I know that that's always been a place that we go from time to year. Specifically, Instagram and WhatsApp. Phil Weiser, the attorney general, state of Colorado. Yes, Colorado's college skis. Colorado, are you still skiing? Yep, I'm still skiing. Wow, man, that's awesome. And I should say before we begin, what's up? For the record, it was good at Harriet this morning in Colorado. Really? Yeah, it was. Yeah, they they moved the uh, this morning. The state moved the uh, big the big garage where uh, John was housing the snow machine. They moved it to the other side of the parking lot. Yeah. Oh. Hey, Rick. Yeah. Rick. Who's that? I can't. Yeah. Who is Esther. it now? Oh, hi, Esther. Esther. Hi, Esther. Hey, Bill, it's good to see you. Hey, Paul, how are you? Well, we're so happy to see so many of you here tonight. Glad you're joining us. Oh, 72 people. Wow. That's awesome. It's the largest so far, isn't it, Joe? Oh, definitely. Yes, that's... Hey, it looks like Rick. <laughs> Must not be much else to do on uh, Wednesday night. <laughs> I think the Frenches can pack a room. <laughs> Esther, you know, everybody can hear you when you talk on here. <laughs> yeah, well, Jeff just came over <laughs> and watched. Bill, Bill is eating. Because he went with you to Bhutan. Mm. Here's Jeff. Hey, Rick. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> so the skiing was good this morning? It was pretty good. It got a little sticky later in the morning. It was better when it was really cold. Oh. Yeah. What, do have to, what do you think? Is it anything tomorrow? I... Uh, very, very early, but you know, given the temperature there, it'll be just at freezing there tonight, but by late morning, it's going to be above freezing up there, so it's going to get yeah. soft and sticky, so you'd have to get there pretty early in the morning. Oh, okay, well, yeah. I, I may wait for another day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you Jeff, mean by you're not in the picture. Rick, <laughs> what do you mean by pretty early? You mean 7, 8 a.m.? Yeah, 7 or 8 a.m. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I got to look a little closer at the weather report, so it's a little bit of guess, you know, with the temperature. Uh, no, tonight I'm in Walworth, but normally in Kenesha, so I can get a better gauge on it. But, uh, you know, it, ideally it should stay below freezing, but I think from what I saw at the weather report, I think by late morning it's going to be above freezing. And once it gets above freezing, there's not that much snow, and it hasn't been groomed, so it's going to be sticky. So, yeah, yeah you want to get there 738, I think, tomorrow. Yeah. I found as I've hiked on Monday and Tuesday, when I started at 9.30 or 10, it was crunchy, but by the time I finished, it was soft, you know? Exactly, so, exactly, Bill. Um, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's a women's hike tomorrow that is at uh, Menden Ponds doing the West Esker and a couple other areas. That's from 10 to 12. And then next week, we're looking at doing Lucian Morin. Uh, park from 10 to 12 on Thursday the let's see 17th if anyone wants to join okay <laughs> bring your Cthulhu's Jill when you do Lucian Morin I, I did take a actually Lucian Morin this week was kind of slippery it was muddy slippery oh my it's either slippery snow or slippery mud, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I've so. noticed that, Jill, I've noticed that Lucian Morn is fairly busy. Every time I've gone by there in the last few, few uh, the last few weeks, it seems awfully, awfully busy. 
in terms of the number of cars? I I hiked on Monday and I we did see three people, but very spread out at at different times, but not not large groups or anything. Hmm. Oh, good. Good, good. If you've got to go when the weather is lousy, that keeps the crowds down. <laughs> right. When when well, Ryan had scheduled a hike there, we had snow and rain and sleet and snow and rain and sleet. It was an exciting hike. <laughs> and, and I think a couple of us fell on that hike, didn't we? We slipped and, yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah. The basis was deposited. Like, Hey, <laughs> that's supposed to go into the <laughs> <laughs> My mother had to explain. Like, Where? You need to tilt your thing down because our head is getting cut off. Well, I, I, I can't see it. Well, I love you. OK, guys, we're going we're gonna to cut off the social part here for a little bit. Uh, so that we can get announcements from Luke. Uh, if I'd appreciate it if you would all mute for the for Luke and also for the presentation. Uh, one other thing is right now we have about 87 people on the Zoom call, and it, people keep coming in. They're now up to 88. There is a limit of 100 people, and we might just we might just reach that tonight uh, at the rate we're going. We're at 89 now. So uh, if you drop out, please be patient. You may have to wait in line to get back in for someone to, to drop out for you to come back. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Luke, our chapter chair, for announcements. Uh, Luke, you there? Yes, I am. Yep. Okay, so just a, a, a few things for chapter business. Uh, like people have said, make sure you continue to monitor the website because all the hikes, all the meetings, all the events are, are always updated on the website. So that's the best, best place to go. Uh, we're still looking for a few positions. If any of you are interested in these, please contact me. Uh, we're still looking for a programs chair, a young members chair, uh, and also a trails co-chair. Uh, Larry is a co-chair and if we could get someone to work with Larry to earn a position to learn all the different things about the outings then that would be really really good. Dave can you mute everybody else please? Uh, also one of the things we do towards the end of the year is the slate of officers for the following year. Um, for the upcoming year, the, the officers, the officers that have been nominated are myself for chair, Bill Catalano for vice chair, Mary Ruth Merkel for the treasurer, and Reinhard Gazelmeyer for secretary. Uh, and uh, Reinhard, if you could uh, cast your ballot. Okay, let me unmute. Oh uh, yeah, Privy Genesee Valley Chapter Articles of Association. I do feel fine. Hold on, Reinhardt. Hey, Laura, Laura, can you go unmute, please? Thank you. Go ahead, Reinhardt. Yes, in accordance with the Genesee Valley Chapter Articles of Association. I cast my proxy vote for the slate of candidates. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Hear that? Okay. All right. Uh, I don't have any other announcements at this time, Dave and Jill. Who is going to do our introduction? Okay, I am happy to welcome everyone here tonight to hear our speaker, Paul Garson. Paul, I think maybe Paul has brought along some of his friends and Rick has brought along some of their friends from the uh, Pack Paddle and Ski since Paul's trip is from that. But 
Anyway, Paul has been a member of the Adirondack Club for the last 40 or 50 years. He grew up in Western Europe and Central Africa and lived there until the age of 15 when he immigrated to the United States. Paul enjoys hiking and scrambling over peaks. He is on his fourth round of the 46ers and has climbed all 111 4,000 footers of the Northeastern states. Paul has hiked and climbed in France, Switzerland, Sweden, Tanzania, Nepal, Bhutan, Morocco, and Ecuador. For four of those trips, he went with Alan Ski, led by his favorite guide, Rick French, who is here labeled Ricks. Anyway, Paul's favorite place is still the Adirondacks, after all of those places. But he spent many vacations in the Adirondacks with family and made lifelong friends there. He also very much enjoys biking and cross-country skiing. So will you all please welcome Paul Garson. So Paul, you can unmute yourself. Well, we might have to work on, on hearing you a minute because it's kind of difficult to understand you. So let's, let's just, why don't you say a few words and we'll see if we can get comfortable with how you're speaking. Post disabled participant screen sharing, I see. Okay, can you hear me now? No. Is it, is it easy for people to hear him or is there some difficulty right now? There is difficulty right now. Okay, yeah. that's, what I, that's what I think. Okay, um, let's see. <laughs> Anybody have suggestions? <clears throat> well, uh, I haven't spoken in the last two seconds here. Can you hear me now? Can you hear that's, me now? It's, it's better, it's better, better Paul. Oh, yeah. you know what it is? I might have had this uh, folder on my uh, computer microphone. That's, that's better. Okay. It's better, yeah. Okay. So, I, if I can, I still, ah, now I can share a screen. Okay. Um, just a second. Suddenly everything is very small. It's looking good, Paul. We can see your uh, the slide beginning. Okay. Yep. So first, I want to uh, thank Jill and Bill Lidenfelser who invited me to uh, give this presentation to the club as well as all the club members. I was. It was two years ago in the fall that I was in Bhutan. And uh, it's truly amazing how much you can forget over the three years. So Jill and Bill uh, gave me the opportunity to refresh some memory cells here and be able to relive this wonderful trip again. Oh, this is not working. Why isn't this working? Okay. Um, I went uh, with Pack Paddle and Ski to Bhutan 2017. <coughs> Spent 12 days there, eight days on a trek, and then with four days visiting various sites in Paro, Thimphu, and of course the Tiger's Nest Monastery. <clears throat> there were eight clients, shepherded by Rick French, yes, my favorite guide. Uh, the clients were mostly from the Rochester area. We were lucky to have one person from California. And uh, we had also one person that was a little bit outside of the Rochester area. She came from Ithaca. Uh, the age ranged between 33 and 72. I will allow you to guess who the 72 year old was who's now three years older. Where is Bhutan? Well, Bhutan is that small country, size of Switzerland, uh, stuck between two giants, 
China and India. It has a population of about 760,000 people, which correspond to about less than one tenth of the population of Switzerland. Uh, on the right here is a, is a map of Bhutan. When we came into Bhutan via the city of Paro, Paro is the only city in Bhutan that has an international airport. Uh, we spent a bit of time around Paro in the in so-called Paro Valley. There are quite a few sites to visit, including the tiger's nest, uh, which I will discuss a little bit later. And from there, we went to Jigme Dorji National Park, uh, where we were on a trek for eight days, going by some fairly large mountain, especially Jamal Hari, which is called the mountain goddess in Bhutan, it's the second highest mountain in Bhutan. It stands at 24,000 feet. So we spend the majority of our time in the western part of the country and didn't really go at all in the eastern part of the country. So, you know, having spent 12 days in Bhutan, uh, and eight of those days walking in the mountains and in forest, I am certainly far from being an expert on the country, but there are some memorable facts about the country. Uh, <clears throat> since 2008, it has been a democratic constitutional monarchy. Until 2008, it was a hereditary absolute monarchy. And the fascinating thing also, and I think the most, which makes it particularly interesting to visit, is that it was closed to the outside world until 1974. TV was not even let in until 1999. Uh, they are very lucky. Anyway, <laughs> it's a deeply Buddhist place. And it is centered on the now famous Gross Happiness Index. GHI. I am sure that many of you have heard of it. Uh, I had, I was quite skeptical at the beginning when I was hearing, I thought it was all poppycock, but uh, I was really losing track of the big picture. And the big picture is, and when I can't. Amy iPad. Anyway, uh, what what I was saying is that um, I, I I was quite skeptical at the beginning, but then I realized the big picture is that you certainly don't completely abandon your economic growth as a metric, but you just promote the well-being of your people and the happiness of your people. And in doing so, uh, certain things get promoted to much higher priorities, such as a sustainable environment, clean water, clean air, uh, edu education, medical care, uh, gov good governance, we can use that, uh, and infrastructure. So as a result, you know, the country is not a rich country, but they have free medical care and education. They have an unemployment rate of 2.3%. By law, 60% of the country must remain forested. It is currently stand at 70%. Isn't that an example to follow? Uh, and Bhutan is the only country in the world that's carbon neutral, but it is the only country in the world that is carbon negative. That means that it absorbs more carbon than it releases. Uh, so those are the, some striking facts about Bhutan that I just wanted to share with you. I also forgot when in my introduction, that the background to the slide is the Bhutanese flag. 
And as you might know, the uh, Bhutan is known as the land of the Thunder Dragon, and the dragon is prominently uh, shown on their flag. This is a picture that uh, I took from the window in the airplane. And it pretty much shows that Cairo Airport is surrounded by 18,000 foot plus mountains. Uh, that as a result gives that airport the distinction of being the number one most dangerous airport in the world. Luckily, I wasn't aware of that when I was flying there. Uh, and only something like 24 pilots are certified to fly in and out of the Paro Airport in Bhutan. This is one of the first picture I took uh, from the hotel. It shows you the Paro Valley, which at this, at this was at about 7,300 feet altitude. Uh, it shows the kind of weather we had. I had most of the time while I was over there. Uh, and uh, it shows the Paro, what I call the Paro River. I'm sh not sure that's what it's called, but it's basically this river that runs along the whole uh, Paro Valley. And it's actually the, we will follow it to some extent as we start by trek. This is the hotel that Rick had reserved for us, a wonderful place. And it, immediately you know that you are in a Buddhist country and that you certainly are uh, not in a state anymore. My, let's see. Then in the afternoon, we took, we took a little reconnoiter to visit our environment. And what you immediately see is that all the roofs, um, metal roofs are covered with chili peppers. Peppers in Bhutan are just not a spice, they're really a staple food. Um, and they even put them on the roof of their car. And from there, we went to a Buddhist art store and uh, were introduced to this interesting, unique custom in Bhutan to have to paint penises on the facade of their houses and walls. Uh, the, pen the penis is supposedly wards evil and brings on good luck. But as a Westerner and as a possessor of the penis, uh, I, I can only think that it's a terrible, it's the last body part that I would choose for this task. So the next day, we are on our way to Tiger's Nest, and here's Rick showing us the way. Up there you go, guys. Um, and this is where we got, this is the Tiger's Nest, <clears throat> one of the most venerated religious monastery in Bhutan. Uh, it is also the uh, tourist site in Bhutan. You cannot see a pamphlet on Bhutan without seeing this picture on the front page. Uh, <clears throat> it is, the story is that Guru Rinpoche in the eighth century uh, came here to subdue a demon. Following that, he spent three months in a cave in the back of this structure within the cliff, uh, meditating. To get up here, we had to walk about 3.4 miles and climb something like 2,700 feet. 
but the guru flew on the back of a tigress and thus the name the tiger's nest. Uh, this is one of the only failing of pack paddle and ski. They were not able to equip us with flying tigers. Uh, <clears throat> As I say, it's a sacred place, so when you go and visit the place, uh, you have to remove your shoes, your hat, you can't take any pictures. Uh, luckily, I was with some good friends who stopped me from taking pictures. I was about to commit a major error. Uh, I probably would have gotten into some trouble. But the whole place is just magical. It's hanging on the sheer, on the side of the cliff, it's basically 3,000 feet above the valley floor over a whispering pine forest. It is just amazing. This is another picture. In order to, in order to access it, you have to climb a little higher than it and you go around and basically take a gentle descent into the site. <clears throat> on our way down, midway up, there is a, uh, there's a tea house. And on the way down, we stopped at a tea house. And this young lady, I couldn't help taking a picture of her. Following that, we went to uh, a hotel to a restaurant. I just wanted to show you that this is a typical Bhutanese uh, building with the Buddhist symbol painted on the facade. Uh, I and I can tell you, I'm a vegetarian, and I very very much enjoy the food in Bhutan. Fresh, 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 fresh. Then we went visit this, the town, and the town is consist of Paro is consists basically of one street lined with shops and uh, selling their wares and their good luck charms. The next day, in preparation for our trek, uh, we took a bus ride to Chaloa Pass which is at about 13,000 plus feet. You basically get started getting acclimatized to high altitude. Uh, I used to be able to click. Ah, oh, here we go. Not didn't want to do that. It's behaving a little differently than when I am not on Zoom. So what you see in, on the many, many places, especially on the top of mountains and little hills are prayer flags uh, and the tall, white prayer flag that attached to poles are basically in, member, in remembrance of somebody that has passed. What I, what I found interesting and learned is that the prayers from those prayer flags are not communicated to the gods, but are the wind is supposed to blow through and permeate the space, the pervading space with uh, goodwill and compassion. Here's the top, you can see all the prayer flags. Uh, this is the group at the, at the, at the top, uh, enjoying the sunshine and the lunch. It was a wonderful group of folks.
Now we're starting our trek. This was our first night. We basically uh, drove over there and got to the site where all the tent was set up for us. We were basically treated like royalty the whole time. Uh, and the next day we started uh, the trek in the Jigni Doji National Park. This is me petting the little statue of the snow leopard. We did not encounter any snow leopard on our hike. Uh, and the fellow next to me there is the head guide, the lead guide. This is the group again. So what was this trek? This trek was quite an expedition, actually. I mean, we had two guides, two cook, two kitchen helper, three horsemen, and 20 horses carrying our stuff. And then uh, Rick French and eight clients. So we had 18, a total of 18 people. And that means that there were 10 people taking care of eight clients. Uh, as I said, we were treated very, very well. I've, ta I've not taken, as Jill mentioned in the introduction, I've not taken four major trips with pack paddle and skis, and they've all been awesome. And uh, I can't say any good th enough good thing about Rick and his, and his group. So the, this is a picture of the area we hiked in. The little blue line is uh, what I recorded on a GPS as I walked the trek. And I then uploaded it onto a Google map to get this, to get this map. Uh, as I said, we were there eight days. Uh, and we started at an altitude about just a little under, you know, 9,500 feet. And we go over two, we, you will go over two paths, one that's a little under 16,000 feet and one that's a little above 16,000 feet. Um, the first day we went here, I've got always a difficult time pronouncing that word, thank, ah, thank, ka, whatever. Uh, and from there, we went to Jamalhari Base Camp. It's interesting uh, that it's called Jamalhari Base Camp. You would think that it was used to climb Jamalhari, which is basically this 24,000 beauty here. Uh, but it's never been used to climb that peak. Uh, this little yellow line here demarks the frontier between China and Bhutan. I prefer to say between Tibet and Bhutan. And it's, I believe that this mountain is most awfully climbed from the, from the Tibetan side. I know that it was first climbed in 1937 by a British group uh, from the Tibet side. We spent a whole day at uh, the base camp to acclimatize at 18. And during the course of that day, we will we climb about a thousand feet toward uh, Chamalhari. So we climbed to about 14.5 and walked about six miles just to, to basically get ready for the next day when we go over, went over the Yalala Pass to Lingxi, from Lingxi to over the Yalila Pass to Shodu. And you can see that from here to about here, we are above tree line. It, you know, it becomes, we lose the green. And, uh, and, and from basically from Yalila Pass on to the end of the trek, we basically go downhill. And 
through this very lush green area here, which is which was all pristine virgin forest in the US. When we left the trek, we went on to Thimphu, the capital. Uh, okay, where are you? Oh, here you go. This is our first day. Uh, I will not have too many slides of the first day, just to try to save on time. Is it okay if I close uh, the door? But these are. These are the horses, the little twin horses that were carrying our stuff. Uh, as a trekker, we had we 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 carried a, a small backpack and anywhere around 20 to 25 pounds. Maybe people had some more. And we had uh, a duffel that was carried by the horses that weighed between anywhere between 20 and 30 pounds. Uh, and they but they carried all the food, the tents. Uh, our beddings. It, 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 it really is somewhat reminds me of the English expedition you read uh, in the Himalayas in the 1930s. And it was quite, quite an expedition. Then we were from that little town to Jamalhari base camp. Uh, this is early in the morning before we leave. It's, really, it's always a lovely time. And as I try, and here we go, we're starting to go above tree line. Now I will not speak as much and let you enjoy the sights. Oh, this is a uh, this is the little horse that had uh, good luck of carrying our lunch uh, together with a some kids. And this is still the extension of the. Paro, what I call the Paro River. I might have another name. This was a lunch site. It was very nice, except for the number, the large number of people here. It's very difficult to talk without looking at the people to whom you're talking to and seeing their reaction and being able to interact with the audience. It's, it's different. Uh, <clears throat> then we walked by a little village and they were having archery competition. Archery in Bhutan is a national sport. They are crazy about it. And it's also, it also appeared to us to always be a good reason for, par for a party. <clears throat> and as you can see, they're not using Gen 1 bow. They're using pretty, com pretty sophisticated compound bows. In that village, we had uh, the opportunity to stop at a school and visit with the teachers and meet the children. It was just lovely. And um, <clears throat> I just got fascinated by the fact that uh, we had words of Abraham Lincoln next to the words of Buddha. Uh, and, you know, the kids, as you will see, are pretty young, but they learn English from a very, very early age. Here's the, here are the children that we, and the two teachers. Uh, 
Oh, he's, here's our lead horse. The lead horse always has this fancy pompon on the top of his head and this fancy headdress. Now this is uh, the little sign that says we've arrived at uh, Jamalhari base camp. Uh, Jamalhari is, is being hidden by the fog in the back. And we are at about a little over 13,000, 13,500, I think 13,500 feet here. So we're getting to beginning to gain some altitude. This is supposedly a very busy base camp, um, but there were other people besides us, but it, it certainly didn't feel busy. So this is our next day when we walk, we, we climbing toward Jamalhari, uh, you can you can see there in the background our tents. The sights are just astounding. Here's Jamal Hari in its full glory. So from there, we walk down to Lingxi and over the Niela Lep Pass. The temperature during the day ranged between 45 and 55 ideal for just this kind of hiking we just and clear clear air and days um, we had but good weather at night it can down get down to freezing or slightly below This is our lunch spot that day. Not bad, is it? And here we are over Nyalala Pass, 15.5. I don't think we look too energetic in this picture. Rightly so. But Jerry's still lifting his arm. Now, I don't know if you notice these uh, metal pole, basically transmission line in some of the pictures. Uh, one of the thing that uh, the government has felt was important is to bring electricity to all their people, however remote they are located. And so that's what they're doing. Unfortunately, the poles are this transmission line are going along 
close to the hiking route, trekking route. <clears throat> Bhutan has two great sources of income, selling hydroelectric power and tourism. So electricity is not expensive for them. Here we're approaching Lingxi. You can see that uh, our, our, site, our camps have already been established. This is uh, one of our client. She she was she was really in very good condition. She had prepared very hard for the trek, but she was just, just had a hard time with the altitude. Uh, altitude sickness is sort of unpredictable. And you never know when you're going to get it. And so, Rick organized for her to basically have a horse ride back, horse ride back. This is, and here we are, on top of Yellow Lip Pass. And from here on, it's mostly downhill. Uh, this is this was early in the morning again. Camp, I camp. Just idyllic conditions. And we're getting into the more in the forested area, lower altitude. And those trees are never been logged. It's just uh, big junipers.
Well, here I am. We here we are both back at the camp at the camp where we're going to be look, both looking forward to our meal. But you can see how small these horses are. They they're such a nice little beast. Now we're moving on to our next it's in October and it's in the fall so there are colors especially a lot of the large trees large trees Uh, then we came upon this um, Buddhist monastery where we were warmly received and got to uh, visit their kitchen. And like a lot of the uh, Buddhist monastery, they have they have children. Um, there are children there. Typically, there there are children from families that no longer have, they don't have the means to feed them, and so they join. They go to they they are sent to the to these Buddhist monasteries. Um, some become or are ordained, but I I think most not. We were both curious about each other. <clears throat> uh, as I say, they, tourism is a good, is a great source of, is a big source of income for them. So they work on their infrastructure, and here they're repairing trails. And Rick will never miss an opportunity to mix with the local and interact with the local and have a good time. He's, here he's taking a ride with, on the log toward the construction site. Just is hanging around, throwing rocks in the river. This was a launch site.
And this is our last camp. We're on our way to the Dina from where we from which from where we will go to Thimphu. And being a hearty breakfast, you can tell it's a little cool. Starting to hike and uh, well, we can't stop progress from, and so they, they're building a road. Uh, and who knows what's going to happen to that part of the track. <clears throat> and just the last, last bit, we just walked on the road. It was still beautiful. It was still majestic and very pleasant. So that, so that's the end. We got to, to Dino. So what's the uh, some of the stats altogether was 80 miles. We average about 10 miles a day. Uh, we climbed about 20,000 feet. <clears throat> and we went from an altitude of 8,500 feet all the way to 16,100 plus. At, uh, at the end of the trail, our host received us with a case of beer. And here is Sarah showing us the, this great beverage we've been seeking. And this is a typical Bhutanese house that was just at the entrance to the, to the, to the park. And now we go to Fenfu. Thimphu is the only capital in Asia that does not have a red light. But they have a major, they have an intersection and uh, that's being manned and being directed by policemen. And it's one of the biggest attractions of Thimphu. Everybody goes and see the policemen direct traffic in this little house there. So we went to a few sites, but I will focus on the uh, Buddha of Dordina, uh, which commands the entrance to the Thimphu Valley. It's one of the biggest Buddha in the world. It is 171 feet tall, and <clears throat> it uh, it's sits there on this robust structure that's three story high which is basically a chapel uh, under it. Uh, it's, a, it's a steel structure um, with bronze covering and gilded gold. And it's filled with 125,000 Buddhas that are either eight or 12 inches high that are similarly bronze gilded uh, gold. Uh, It, it, the, it was started to be built only in 2006 and was complete in 2015. It was, it was built in China and trucked over. Uh, the Buddha itself cost like something like $47 million. The whole site um, cost about $100 million. So it, and at night, the light, the, it's lit, and it's quite impressive. This 
this is inside the chapel. And then this included one drawing. While we were there, there was there was a religious event, and there was a large, large number of people there. Um, oh, okay, these cute little girls. Uh, <clears throat> I never really learned what the reason was for this assemblage. But it was interesting to see all this. Uh, and this is basically when we returned back toward the US. Uh, but that evening, uh, our host organized a show for us of folk dances. So here's one of the ladies that was participating in this folk dance. Uh, I will show one three minute uh, folk dance from the, from the guys. It's, a, it's called a mask dance to give you an idea. Here it is. Oh boy, how do I open? Here we go. No picture, Paul. It's just the sound, but that's oh, is okay. that right? Yeah. Well, I'll stop it then. Beg your pardon. Okay. <clears throat> ah, well, that's too bad. Why did? Why is that? <laughs> but Jim says it's good sound anyway. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I. It's okay, it's a small thing, it's no problem. Just go on to the next slide. Well, what is the best part about uh, traveling? And it's to come home. And so I was able to equip all the grandchildren with a Bhutanese we, we can't doctor see. outfit. Can you make sure you can try to see your screen? Are you sharing your screen again? Well, you don't see that either? Now we do. Now you do. Yep. OK. So as I said, uh, these are all the grandkids with Bhutanese soccer shirts and I mean, soccer outfit, excuse me, so that now the roaring, the roaring dragon is a powerful soccer team. Mm. 
Now, how do I, oh, here we go. So this is it. If it is not Shrangala, it is as close as it gets, lonely planet. And it was, a, it really was a beautiful place. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for speaking to us tonight. Uh, we, this is the official end of the presentation, but we invite anyone who would like to talk to Paul or ask some questions to stay on and uh, you can unmute yourself and Paul, can, I think we'll maybe stop sharing Paul's screen and then the thumbnails are up. And if you have something you would like to say, you can unmute your screen. Uh, we can tell, uh, there are some things in the chat and uh, I'll see. Oh, the chat. Many have, yeah, Point many people seven. have said, thank you. But um, one question here is, what is the source of their heating energy in Bhutan? Do you know that, Paul? I think they use yak dunk and wood. As well as I think in, in the town, I think they use electricity. As I said, electricity in, Utah, in Bhutan is not expensive because they generate quite a lot of hydroelectric power. But I am, to some extent, I am guessing. Okay. Another question is, what was the incidence of respiratory illness, a common problem at high altitude with wind and uh, animals, horses and yak, etc.? Was this a problem in your group? None whatsoever. None? Um, not, no, not at all. It was, we, I think a lot of it is due to dust. So, and there was there was no dust. It's, it was not. It's not like being in Nepal. It, there's a tendency to have more dust because the trail traveled to a much greater extent. But uh, no, we didn't have any 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 problem with that. Awesome. Okay, another question from Linda Riordan. Uh, Riordan, maybe. What did you have to do to condition yourself for the altitude? Well, it's tricky because you, you do everything to get in aerobically in good condition. But as I try to say during the course of the presentation, it's, you cannot foretell how well you're going to do with altitude, even if you're in really good condition until you get there. Uh, most of us were, were not troubled with it. Uh, I've been lucky not to be bothered by it uh, most of the time, but uh, I consider it luck, not necessarily anything that I did that was mm -hmm. beyond getting in decent shape. Okay, Charlie Capolino is saying, great trip and presentation. How was the night sky? The night sky can be like it was in Tanzania and Nepal. It can be really, really very starry and beautiful. There is no, as you would, as you would expect, there is no uh, any kind of light pollution uh, there. So there are, it is very, very nice. Okay, Garth is sharing that hydropower is the main source of energy in Bhutan. Right. And Coleridge uh, Gill says, very enjoyable and informative. Carol Mahar, pre incredible presentation, thank you. Uh, you probably mentioned this in your talk, but who did you arrange your trek with? Oh, I <laughs> pack, paddle, and ski. So pack, paddle, and ski is the local. Uh, oh, well, pack, paddle, and ski then, I mean, I made, I made the, we made the arrangement pack paddle of ski. And then they made all the negotiation with uh, 
the powers to be in Bhutan. So maybe Rick, if he's still here, can talk to that. Uh, I really don't know. Rick, can you? He was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't sleeping, Paula. <laughs> I was listening to your melodic voice, and it was so <laughs> soothing to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, it's the same as many places that we go in the world. We we know different pla people in different places of the world, and and then we make the arrangements as need be with the local people. So Paul made arrangements with us, and then I made arrangements with the people I know in in uh, Bhutan. Okay, Jack Schrader is asking, what were the normal daytime temperatures? Were you always cold? I was always comfortable. It was, as I say, it was for between 45 and 55. It was during the day and it was, and it was sunny. It was sunny. We had only at Jamalhari base camp, we had an iffy day, but it was like a day of drizzle. It was not, it was, it was, it was just fine. That's awesome. I, I, I think if the other people that were there to participate in the, in a track that can speak up, but I don't think any of us were cold, really. Rick, did anybody complain about being cold? <laughs> no. no. No one ever complains on a trip, Paula. Otherwise, we lose them. <laughs> I, <clears throat> I, might, I might have missed this when you were speaking earlier, but did you talk about the gross happiness index? Uh, I did. Maybe I didn't do it very well. <laughs> Since it, you missed it. <laughs> no, I, I might not have been listening at that moment. That's. Mm -hmm. I found that fascinating. That that's uh, something that even exists in Bhutan. Mm -hmm. We could bring that to this country. What a gift it would be. Any other questions for Paul? Wow. Paul, you've done a phenomenal job. Thank you very much. I think I do, have one, I do have one question. Where did they get the $20 million to, to put that, uh, if it's such a uh, economically challenged country, where did they get the $20 million to put that great big Buddha on top of uh, uh, the, the the whole thing cost a hundred million dollars. Okay. So as I said, they they uh, I believe that they their main source of income, as Garth just again amplified, is hydroelectric selling hydroelectric power to both to I think to mostly India. I don't know I don't know if they sell any to China as well. They could well be, but I'm not sure. And tourism. And I, if you go there as a tourist, you have, I, I think there's a fee on the order of $250 per day that you have to give the government. Uh, and probably Rick can talk a lot more about this than, because I didn't do any of those negotiations. Uh, but if you go there as alone, as a, on your own, you will, you have to pay something in the order of $250 a day. For that, they provide some service, but you know, and I think their main reason for doing that, as far as I understand, was to not have happened to them what happened in Nepal, where a lot of uh, hippie went there in the 1960s and basically took over Kathmandu and. <clears throat> So they were trying to avoid that by charging a fee, as well as being able to provide some, generate some income from them. Rick, can you say more about? about which part? <laughs> well, what, how much you pay per day to? Yeah, the, uh, <laughs> yeah I mean, you mentioned a bunch of different parts. Um, you know, also, just like in a Christian church, um, tithing and, and a portion of, of uh, donations is in any religion is donated to, to a religion. So it's probably a mix of religion. The people in the religion, the people in the government, like Paul said, in Bhutan, 
um, you know, it's a longer story how it happened, but yeah, they, they charge a per person fee and that fee goes to preservation of the country and infrastructure, preservation of culture. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a higher end tourist place because of that. Their well, goal is like 65,000 people a year. Okay. Jack Schrader had another question. How were the toilets provided on your trek? No, That's, it can't be that important to me because I can't. <laughs> well, I think at, at, at the, uh, there were some toilets provided at all the camps. Uh, But they dig. They, I they don't have a little outhouse tent, Paul. Remember, they had the little outhouse tents where they dig a yeah. hole and they put up a little toilet in there. It's a little outhouse tent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Jerry Fletcher added this thought. He said that because of TB, uh, because TB was long absent, Bhutanese had different cultural ideals of female attractiveness. Women were more valued for practical features, what they could do, not their looks. TV and broadcast advertising has begun to change that. So. Well, I, I, I really thought, and I tried to say that at the beginning, that it, it, it was a privilege to be able to go to a place which evolved and had a culture that was not really, that had never really been influenced by Western world. It was not, it, it was, it was one of the few countries that was not colonized. Uh, so they have, it's, it's interesting, they, they have different perspectives, different ideas than we do, they're very different. Yeah. But of course that would not last with the fact that the world is becoming homogeneously civilized it's the same way. They don't have a McDonald yet. Do they, they don't have a McDonald yet. Not yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, I will tell you a couple more comments of feedback, and then I think maybe we need to end our uh, programming. But Todd Williams says, you're doing great, Paul. Keep up the entertainment. Jeffrey Davis said, absolutely incredible. Marsha Barrett, these pictures are amazing, and I enjoyed your presentation, Paul. Peter Collins said, great photos, Paul. Thanks. Sarah Maestro, beautiful photos. Thank you for sharing your journey with us. Jean Herrick offered, what an adventure. Thanks for taking us along. Jet said, thank you, Paul, for a glorious adventure. And um, that Peter said, yes, interesting music. Paul Losi, thanks, Paul. Anyway, wow. I think we need to say good night and wind up this evening. But I thank you all for attending. It was uh, such a great gathering. Thank you for being here. And we'll have another program next month, the second Tuesday, Wednesday of the month. Sorry about that. Uh, take time. I want to say again, thank you for inviting me. And I want to say thank you to Pack Paddle and Ski to make it possible for me to have gone there and to have uh, I've had that privilege. It was, it was really a privilege. Well, thank you, Paul, for sharing that with us. That was really great. You did a wonderful job. Thank you all for being here. And we wish you a good night. Very thanks, Paul. Good night. Good night. Happy holidays to everyone. You too. Thank, you. Thank you, Paul, for a great, great show. Really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you, Gil. It's wonderful seeing you. Nice seeing you too. Give my Maybe regards. I'll see you somewhere cross-country skiing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs>